have you ever felt like screaming and pulling out your hair and saying, would someone just lead or just get people working better together? I know I have. But what if you could be the leader that you need and that you didn't have to rely on someone else to make this happen? So today I want to share how you can do this. But first, I want to thank you for making time for today's talk because good leadership is so important for your projects to be healthy with collaborative, productive interactions and good outcomes. So I'm really grateful that you're taking the time to learn about leadership and how to strengthen your skills. So today, that's exactly what we're going to focus on. What is leadership? How do you strengthen leadership skills? And I want to go a little bit further and talk about how we help projects have more diverse leadership. How do we get people of underrepresented groups to step in and take on more leadership roles as well? So hopefully that sounds good. And let's go ahead and dive in with a story that helps kind of explain what leadership is, especially in the world of open source. So a couple years ago, I was working on a project where we wanted to improve the contributor experience in, for an open source project. And we started by interviewing um, a lot of community members about their contribution journey, that first experience. And we wanted to see where the friction was. And there was one story that really stood out to me as a great example. And um, it was about this, uh, this one guy who was new to the project and wanted to make their first contribution. Pretty standard, right? But unfortunately, there was a problem. This person was looking in the forums for help and was watching the issue queues and watching everyone interacting. And he thought it was really intimidating. Uh, the interactions weren't exactly positive and they kind of made newcomers feel a little dumb for not knowing how to do things the right way. And of course, when you're new, you don't know these things. And he really wanted to make this contribution, but he waited a whole year just watching to see, well, now can I jump in or do I feel comfortable now? And it took a whole year for him to finally say, I really want to do this, but I need a new approach. And he reached out to the mentor, um, somebody in the community who was more of a veteran and said, I'd really like to do this. Um, and I don't know how, and I'm feeling a little intimidated. Would you help me? And this person said, I'd be happy to mentor you. And this is, you know, volunteer time at night or weekends. And the person gave up their time and helped out this person who wanted to make their first time contribution. And fortunately, it worked out. This person did make their first contribution. And because they have a learning mindset, they were able to contribute again and again and again. And today, this person is one of the top contributors for the open source project, which is just an amazing outcome. But it's also really unfortunate. I mean, how many contributions were lost because this person waited a whole year? Well, if you look at this person's um, contribution record, they lost 400 contributions that year. That's what they, were they are averaging. And that's a lot of contributions to lose. And then how many contributions are lost because people didn't push through and figure out how to get started on that contribution journey? And the answer is just too many, too many people. And it's a shame because it doesn't have to be this way. You know, people in open source, they want to get involved. They want to help. That is what open source is all about. But sometimes when people step in to help, they don't realize that they're actually stepping up into leadership roles. These roles aren't defined as leadership roles. There's no training for leadership in general, but specifically in open source. And they don't realize that when they start in these roles, they're way of working sets the tone for how others work. So if they are not having positive, productive interactions, others probably aren't either. 
because they're that's just what they're modeling and you know these newcomers they're watching they're seeing all of this and so it is just really unfortunate and a shame that this is just a challenge in open source but in so many aspects of life and this is why i like to give this talk on leadership just so i can shine a light on this area we could all be a little more self-aware about leadership and open source so let's dive into leadership and start to unpack a little bit of, by asking who were the leaders in this story the forum moderator it's definitely a leader has a lot of influence of what's happening in that forum and how people are interacting and the person managing the issue queues is also a leader they are not only deciding how what's going in to the code base but how the interactions are happening in that arena as well um, the mentor is a leader offering a whole new way of helping the project taking someone's hand helping them with their first time contribution and the contributor is also a leader which might be surprising because it's an individual but I'm gonna kind of get into how and why that contributor is considered a leader. So what is leadership? Well, there's actually no one definition. This one happens to be one I like the most by Kevin Cruz, a leadership expert. And it says, leadership is a process of social influence, which maximizes the efforts of others towards the achievement of a goal. So you see, it's about influencing others and it's about getting people to come together to achieve something together. And sometimes it's easy to describe what something is by explaining what it is not. So leadership is not a title or a role. It is not about uh, having been a CEO or a manager at a company or a project lead in open source. It doesn't require an actual title anyone can lead from any role and it's not a personality type some people think oh i'm not extroverted enough and gregarious enough to be a leader and that's not true many leaders and many good leaders are also introverts and leadership is not management management is making sure budgets are spent on on time and people are following processes and procedures correctly that is not what leadership is about. <clears throat> and leadership is absolutely not about power or authority. It is about influence and getting people inspired to want to move towards a goal and a vision that you have. There are also three types of leadership. There's leading organizations. So in a company, that leadership role might be the CEO. In a project, it could be a project lead. And then there's leading others. And this might be the forum moderator or uh, someone in charge of the mentor program. Uh, it could be um, a director at a company. And then there is leading yourself. And this is about managing yourself um, through any kind of challenge, any kind of interaction, so that you get a desired outcome when you're working with others. And this is what the contributor in the story was doing, was leading themselves. They took an entire year trying to figure this out. They were very overwhelmed and intimidated, but then they kind of did a self-check. They said, I need a new strategy. And then they found someone to reach out to that could help. And that, that shift is that person leading themselves to finally figure out a new way to make a contribution. And I'm gonna focus on um, leading yourself because you can't lead others until you learn how to lead yourself. It is so important. And that's because the more responsibilities you take on leading others, leading organizations, the more stress you're going to take on. And you have to know how to really stay centered and calm and navigate through that so that people can follow you through it and achieve something. 
And uh, so I'm going to focus on self-leadership for this um, talk. And it's also important because open source is about all of us as individuals coming together. We all have to learn self-leadership so that we have the best interactions, the healthiest project we possibly can have. So whether you're a CEO, a project lead, or an individual contributor, what do leaders do? Well, they shape a vision. So the contributor's vision was, I'm going to make a contribution. It doesn't always have to be grandiose, but you have to have a vision. And then you need to have a strategy to achieve that. So how are you going to do that? Well, waiting a year clearly didn't work for this person. They had to come up with a new strategy, which was asking for help. And then you need to get people on board to help achieve that vision. And that's exactly what that individual contributor did. He reached out to that mentor and said, I really want this. Will you help me? Right. And of course, that person did join the team and took time to make it happen. And a leader focuses on measurable results, not random acts of activity, focus goals, measurable results. For this contributor, it was one contribution, not hard. Of course, over time, it became 400 contributions with success. Um, and a leader fosters innovation and learning. So when they foster innovation, they are using that learning mindset to you know, take everything that they've learned from their successes and their failures and apply it to moving things forward, thinking about new ideas, looking for new ideas, looking for diverse perspectives. That's what a leader does. And of course, as they're doing all of this, they're leading themselves and managing their emotions in order to get that outcome that they want. And you need skills, certain skills to be a leader. And um, from Harvard Business Review research, they identified these skills that are key for good leadership. As you can see, there's, you know, uh, inspire and motivate. They have integrity and honesty. They have drive. They communicate. They have good collaboration to build teamwork, good relationships. It goes on and on and on. And what you see here is that it is not about technical skills not about how great they know computer science or how to um, build something. It is about interpersonal skills, core skills. And these are really important to have if you want to lead, including leading yourself. And so this might be a little bit surprising, but leadership is actually two thirds of leadership depends on emotional intelligence. That is at the core of these leadership skills. And unfortunately, this is not an area we get a lot of training. Uh, you know, in the US, we joke that the last time we were taught emotional intelligence was in kindergarten at the start of our education, where we were just taught to use our words, don't punch don't punch other kids, but use your words. And, you know, there's just not a lot of systemic training in emotional intelligence. And unfortunately, well, actually, let me just dive in and say that in case you don't know what it is, emotional intelligence is simply recognizing, understanding, being able to manage your own emotions. So having control, self-awareness, self-regulation, control, over your emotions, especially when things are coming at you, maybe it's certain emails that are frustrating you and, you know, and then it's deciding how you interact with others. So recognizing, understanding and influencing the emotions of others and how to tap in so that you can work with that person and get a really positive outcome. And unfortunately, as a species, we're just really bad at this. Um, so Dan Goleman, who wrote the book on emotional intelligence, says only 36% of people are able to accurately identify their own emotions as they happen. And let's face it, in open source, things are happening all the time, whether it's in GitHub or Twitter, uh, the issue queues, wherever you are, there's, all, there's just back and forth happening all the time. And uh, 
you know, we are not always very aware of how we're feeling, how others are feeling, and being really strategic with our interactions with people. Uh, that's just how we're wired, unfortunately, as humans. But there is good news. You can improve emotional intelligence. And neuroscience found that emotional intelligence can actually be improved with mindfulness. And this is the act of settling the mind and being aware of the present moment. You can achieve this through meditation, journaling. One person even gave me a tip that you should have a hot cup of tea. We really need to slow down. And that's because when something's so hot, you have to slow down or you're going to burn yourself, right? You're gonna burn your lips. So just sit there with your cup of tea, watch the steam, slowly drink it, and just be really mindful of that experience. Now, personally, when I heard this, I thought, no, this is not for me. I am not going to start doing this. I really just wanna work hard at being a better leader. Just give me the 10 point plan and I'm going to do that. But I did try this and I started to see some differences. And I also um, started to try this because Google was saying, yes, this is actually true. Mindfulness helps with emotional intelligence. They had started a program called Search Inside Yourself, which um, really like leans into this neuroscience, leans into mindfulness. And it's a program that they're trying to give to Googlers so we become better leaders. And they're sharing it with the world. So definitely check out Search Inside Yourself. Um, and they've also put meditation rooms in all of our buildings when we can someday go into a building. Um, but uh, I took advantage of these um, different programs through Google. And I felt that um, I was doing better with my thinking, my interacting with people. And it's kind of hard to explain exactly why. I did feel like I had more resilience. Um, I had more time to sit on my brain and um, have better thought process. And, um, you know, I really think Tara Brock, uh, a Buddhist-based psychologist, explains it the best. Um, and she says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is the opportunity to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And that space is so important. That space between stimulus and response and that space happens when you pause. And it's mindfulness that gives you that resilience and that ability to pause when something happens to you. Whether it's an email that's upset you or just, I don't know, and someone told you that they didn't like what you submitted right and mindfulness gives you the chance to preserve that space so that you can be more strategic in how you respond so that you're not just reacting all the time and so i highly recommend that you check out some form of a mindfulness practice even if it's just slowly sipping a cup of tea every day and you know, in open source, we really need to work on our leadership, our emotional intelligence, and we need to build it with mindfulness. And that's because open source requires us to work online together. And just that environment puts us at a disadvantage because our brains just have a really hard time with positive interactions when we're working online. Uh, so when we collaborate in tools like GitHub and Slack and Twitter, we experience something called the online disinhibition effect. Um, it, there's a couple things that happen. Two main ones are that we lack eye contact. See, our brains are wired to read body language so that we can pick up on cues and adjust our response accordingly. And when there's no eye contact, we can't do that. And actually, we 
reduce our ability to have empathy for the other person. And someone might say, well, just use emojis. Well, guess what? That does not help our brains. It actually doesn't bridge the gap. We still need to meet that need to see people's body language. So we have less empathy when we interact online. And the other thing that happens is how we project a voice onto someone's communication. We all do it. And unfortunately, when an email comes in or we're reading Twitter or whatever it might be, we are assigning a ne more negative voice than what the person intended. Research shows almost always. So when we're working in these online environments, because the way our brain's wired, we aren't as empathetic as we are in person. And we assume the worst of what, how they're communicating with us. That really puts us at a disadvantage. And that is why we all need to be as mindful as possible about our interactions. And we need emotional, like strong emotional intelligence to help lead ourselves through our work in open source online. It doesn't even have to be open source. Now we're all working from home. So it's, you know, just really for everyone that's in this virtual world. Mindfulness definitely is a practice to help strengthen in this area, but that's not going to be enough. It's good to also have strategies that can help you with online communication. So here are just a few pro tips on how to reset when something's upset you so that you respond in a productive way rather than react and just make things worse. So let's imagine you get this email and it's just really upset you. You got a couple things you can do. First, be self-aware that you're having an emotion. You're allowed to have an emotion. You just don't want to react on it. So one option is count to 10. There's lots of science behind just counting to 10 and giving yourself a chance for things to settle in your brain and calm down, maybe get that cortisol level to go down. And you can start doing breathing. Um, lots of um, uh, breathing techniques out there that I recommend you look into. But the act of breathing also helps regulate the brain and slows it down. Again, you can sip hot tea. Can't really do anything if you're about to burn yourself. And if it's really bad, just take a walk. Just know when it's so bad, just take a walk. Because it's not worth you know, just fighting back. You really want to be in the right place so you can respond in a helpful way. And then there are ways to respond that are more productive than others. One is um, using the yes and technique. And this comes from improv. So perhaps someone has an idea and um, yeah, it's a good idea, it's a bad idea. Instead of saying, no, I don't like that which really just puts the person on the defensive and is hard to build from, um, it destroys trust in a communication. Use yes, and yes, that's a good idea. And what about this? That way you're building off of each other's ideas. Another approach is a design approach using I like, I wish, I wonder. So maybe someone sent you a proposal and you can say, I like this part of it, I wish it had also covered another area. And I wonder if you could talk to so-and-so to get a little bit more of this added into your proposal. This way, again, you're building off of something and being positive and, and saying, yeah, there's a gap. And I think there's a path forward for you to address it. I also really encourage everyone to look into nonviolent communication strategies. And this is a whole talk in itself, but there's just ways in which we can communicate where language is helpful. Some language is unhelpful. Learn what is helpful. So check out nonviolent communication. I also really encourage in communication that you use active listening skills. I use this a lot. And it's simply somebody says something to you and you repeat back what you heard. 
That way you can make sure you are all on the same page before you take the conversation to the next step. So, well, Sally, I what I'm hearing you say is you would like to achieve this, this, and this. Is that correct? Okay, great. Now that we're aligned, here's what I recommend. So active listening skills is just a really great way to check in before you jump off into a bigger conversation. And then lastly, because of the way our brains are wired, if you're starting to see communication get tense, just stop with online communication. Know when it's time to get on a video and make sure you're using the video. I think we've all learned this year with COVID, the video makes a huge difference. You really need to see the, everyone's body language. It helps your brain a lot. So these are just some pro tips and they're for everyone. It's for um, helping you learn how to lead yourself so that you have the best interaction possible at work in your open source project, wherever you are. But what about people of underrepresented groups? You know, there's just more to consider to help people from underrepresented groups learn how to lead and get into leadership roles. And actually all of you play an important role in helping to make that happen. You see, it's not a surprise that people of underrepresented groups like women are well, just very underrepresented. You know, as shown here in this 2020 Stack Overflow survey, only 80% of women who were engaging in the survey identified as women. And this is not okay. And it's actually, I think that's lower in this form than other tech stats that I've seen. And we need to improve community diversity, not only because it's the right thing to do, but many perspectives simply create better solutions. It's very pragmatic. And you want better representation throughout your project. And not just in the areas of code contribution or event planning, but in leadership roles too. And the main way to create a diverse community with diverse leaders is to understand the challenges and the blockers. Why isn't this happening? Because once you can understand this, you can start building real solutions. So for example, women have certain headwinds that just hold them back. And they're based on societal challenges. There's, you know, we may not be able to solve these societal challenges within our project but we can certainly understand them so we can find out how to bridge those gaps. So here are eight of these headwinds. One is women, they simply just don't have as much time as others because they are balancing work and life. They take on more um, of the parental responsibilities. So they're taking care of kids and we all know what happened during COVID, right? This really impacted families. And you started to see the systemic challenge there. And if they're, in addition to watching kids, they might be doing elder care and taking care of grandparents. There's also just bias, professional bias. When people think that women just aren't quite as capable. Um, we have to prove ourselves a lot more. There's actual, um, uh, good women CEO research from Harvard Business Review that says that it takes a woman four years longer than men to get into the CEO role. And that's because they have to go through so many more steps to prove themselves. Also, there's just less opportunity. Maybe it's because we don't have time to capture the opportunities out there, or people just kind of didn't think about our training or mentoring us or giving stretch goals. And so we have less opportunity. And there's also this unfortunate uh, thing that happens called a glass cliff. The glass cliff is when women are actually given a leadership role, but it is for something that is doomed to fail. Project's just gonna go sideways. And they often give those opportunities to women or people of underrepresented groups. And they often take it because they think they have to save something. It's like that nurturing nature kicks in and they have to save it. 
they don't realize always that not taking an opportunity is an option. And what happens is, is they uh, often fail or the saving the project, saving the situation comes at such a cost. They're so tired and burnt out. They can't really move forward. Um, these are horrible outcomes, especially for women. Women don't get the same fail forward opportunities, right? We don't get to fail forward. That is not common in a woman's career. And so then they just get less opportunities after that situation. The glass cliff is worse than the glass ceiling. So just keep an eye out for that. And women tend to have more imposter syndrome. People of underrepresented groups have more imposter syndrome, second guessing themselves. When a woman goes to apply for a job, they think they have to be 100% qualified for that job. Men, they'll apply if they meet 60% of the qualifications. No problems, which is great. And uh, But we're holding ourselves back because of that imposter syndrome. We also don't self-promote very well. We're taught to respect the team. It's the team effort. We really value these relationships. And also, we just don't want to come off as you know, bragging, how would people perceive us? That's another issue is just how are people going to react if we act too ambitious? Um, and so we kind of shut down and we don't do it. And we also just, we don't dream big enough. And a lot of times because we don't see women or people of underrepresented groups in bigger roles, or we haven't seen all the opportunities we could have. And, um, so we hold ourselves back just because we, we didn't even think that we could be something more than what we are. So Sally, these are some headwinds, they're not even all of them, but just this is what you're dealing with in your project. This is what a lot of the reasons why we don't have more representation. And it's not okay, right? Because there are actual solutions and I've seen them. And they are so practical that I know that all of our projects if they are intentional, can put them into put into practice. So the good news is, I've seen this. I've seen this very much in Drupal, where I worked for eight years. And so I want to share some of these tips. I've also learned a lot through research that I want to share as well. So the first thing is you need to create psychological safety in your project. And so when a newcomer is watching how a project interacts, you need to have healthy interactions. There is a reason I started with explaining what leadership is and self-leadership and how to have better emotional intelligence. There's a reason I started with these strategies of how to have good interactions because people of underrepresented groups need to see this. This is how you attract us. To, we need to feel welcome and safe. And actually women are more likely to encounter language or content that makes us feel un unwelcome. We're much more apt to bounce if we see something that's like, yeah, no, I don't have time for this. I don't feel safe here. So I really encourage you all to play an active role and be very self-aware and mindful of your interactions in your project. I also encourage you to do what Drupal and other projects like Go have done, which is set values. What do you stand for? What kind of behaviors do you want your community to em embrace? And how does your community value diversity? And how do you live that value? This really sets the tone and helps you really think about, gives you a lens as you kind of assess your community and how are you doing living those values? And then finally, you need a code of conduct. And most projects have a code of conduct. This conference has a code of conduct. This isn't new. But what I really strongly encourage is that you don't just have a code of conduct. You immediately launch an enforcement policy so that people know what happens if you don't have appropriate behavior. And what's the process that you're going to use? so that no one is flat footed when something goes wrong and no one is surprised in the community that a process took place. And it is important to train the people who are going to have to enforce your code of conduct 
so that they are properly supported and know how to navigate this. It takes a lot of core skills to manage a community. So you need to really invest here. And it's important to bridge the gaps of these headwinds. And again, I wanna share some things that I saw in the Drupal community that I think worked really well. I highly encourage projects to um, you know, apply these. There's more, there's definitely more than these three. But the first one is setting up a, a first time contributor mentor program. So again, women or people of underrepresented groups are less apt to just lean into, you know, the abyss of open source strangers and try to get started. So be systematic about it. Start a first time contributor mentor program, make it easy for us to find and that way we have a, a smoother on-ramp that's designed really to, to meet us where we're at. And then the next one is create easy networking opportunities. People of underrepresented groups, women, they don't have the time to network. They are less comfortable networking. Men tend to have more organic networking opportunities. And networking opens you up to mentors and new ideas, new areas to contribute, peer support. Networking is so important to help you stay engaged in a project. And so you wanna make it really easy for um, women, people of underrepresented groups to be able to network. And Drupal really does this well. Um, for example, at their conferences, especially when we could meet in person, they would have first time um, attendee networking events. And newcomers could meet veterans, leaders, and they had a nice, fun, social way of doing this. They had um, Women in Drupal, which was a social event during the week that allowed um, really peer networking and lots of other kinds of networking events. So it's, you know, we don't have to rely on that organic, using our own free time to figure out who we should know in this giant global community really makes a difference. And then also be intentional about creating diversity within your leadership team. Simply put, this means look at your technical committees, look at your foundation board seats, look everywhere. And what is your gender balance? Are you happy with it? You wanna be really intentional and start um, identifying how you can get people of underrepresented groups in these roles, um, which is a whole, you know, asking them and, and grooming them and training them. Th these are all things that are very important, but at least starts aiming for some goals. Uh, the Drupal Association Board aims for a minimum of 30% women on the board, and they're achieving it. And I'm seeing it in other places. I'm on the Open Source Initiative Board, and we have more gender balance there as well. And I'm, I'm so happy to see this in other places, but you have to be intentional and make it a goal. But you can't simply invite a woman or a person of an underrepresented group into a leadership role and just think it's gonna work, because it's not. They're going to have a very different experience. Research shows and experience shows that these people, when they are in leadership roles get more pushback more pushback on the on the authority and scope that they were given and when women people of underrepresented groups start to feel this pushback they don't lean in and fight in the same ways as other groups do but they tend to go into a back channel and kind of work it out there with their peers and that's fine that feels safe that is not great for the project that does not create a shared understanding of what's happening. It does not create a shared solution. Um, and I don't blame them. I mean, I have also found myself sometimes going that way instead of leaning in um, because it's exhausting. And again, we don't have the time or the comfort to deal with that. And so it um, is solvable. And research shows, and my experience has taught me, that there are three key things that projects must do if they want diverse leadership. One is they need to look at their governance and they need to make sure their governance includes these leadership roles that they're asking women to step into. 
They need to make sure it's clear what the role scope is, what that person's authority is, how decisions are made, and also how someone can appeal if they don't like a decision. When is a decision final? This kind of governance is so important because then when someone pushes back, the, the woman in this role, the person from an underrepresented group in this role can say, no, no, this is, this is mine. This is my call to make, and it says so right here. It gives air coverage. And I have seen this in projects, um, several projects now. And so I strongly encourage you to look at your governance. Then also leaders need to be allies. Other leaders, you're gonna see things in Twitter and in forums within the community. You need to step up and say no. Now, none of us are kittens stuck up in a tree somewhere, as Annie DeFranco says, like, you know, we can take care of ourselves, but we need allies. And just by being intentional and speaking up, pointing to that governance, saying, pointing to the values, however you want to handle it, we need you to speak up and get our backs. And then lastly, you need to invest in these leaders and um, I highly recommend you create cohort groups, um, assign them to a coach, an executive coach to be specific, so that together they can start learning how to solve these problems. And the coach is there to help them solve the problems too. This is kind of a new concept, but it is uh, in open source, but it is working very well in many other places. So these are just a few ways to build diverse leaders and they're not hard to put into place. You just have to commit to them. So that's it. That was a lot of content that we just covered. So why don't we do a quick recap? We can lead from any position. You can't lead others until you can lead yourself. And it requires strong emotional intelligence. Um, you also need to Think about ways to grow that emotional intelligence and you can use mindfulness to do that. And there's lots of strategies that you can take advantage of so that you learn to reset when something's upset you and make sure you respond in a productive way versus just reacting and making the situation worse. And that we don't just want leaders, we want diversity of leaders and you have to be very intentional in how you do that. So I want to thank you for going through this journey with me um, and for giving me your time today. And if there is one thing to remember, it is this. Newcomers, women, people of underrepresented groups, they are watching your project and deciding if they want to invest their time with you. And they have a lot to offer. So you need to be mindful of how you are engaging with each other. Be mindful of how you feel when you're interacting. Choose to respond and not react. Because this is how you're gonna get your next great contributor and your next great leader. So I hope you choose to be the leader that we all need. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Megan. That was a great talk. We had some comments in here talking about how inspirational it was. And I certainly learned a lot more strategies of how to react or respond rather than react to certain situations. Um, we have a few questions here, so I'm going to go through them now. Um, the first one is uh, from someone, an anonymous one, it says, thanks so much for your talk. How do you usually promote and sell the value of diversity on all dimensions in the corporate world? Oftentimes, I've seen a corporate commitment to diversity to the outside, but not delivering anything uh, diverse on the organization on the inside, not in leadership nor in teams. Yeah. Uh, yes, there can be a bit of a gap between what people say and what people do. And I am just going to be honest and say, it starts at home. It starts with you. And actually all you can do is control yourself. You can influence others. And so as a manager, 
I can control my outcome. So it's not often that I have a free headcount to fill, but when I do, I have a bench of diverse candidates. I have already identified that I would love to recruit and I've been nurturing that list of people. And I seek them out in advance, and just build a network. And that way, when I get that pressure to fill a headcount before I lose it, not that that happens often in Google, but it's happened in other places, I can um, move quickly, talk to these candidates, get them into the process. I am very, very intentional when it comes to hiring. And so that is what I can do. And then, you know, where do I have influence? you know, above me or with my peers. Um, it's um, calling them out, letting them know I'm not okay if they don't have a diverse team. And also giving them the resources, letting them know I have a bench, maybe it would help them, teaching them how to do this, right? So it really does start at home in your own personal actions. And so those are some that I take. Great answer. Um, I have another question that's similar to um, this topic. And as this person says, I can totally relate to how you described how women are treated and typecasted at work. This has happened to me at the past work where I was unduly blamed for being a complainer as I was returning back from maternity and I was kicked out within the first month of joining and also blacklisted in the company. It is still a big trauma in my mind. Any suggestions on how I could have better dealt with that situation? Was I wrong to be worrying about my newborn kid? Oh, first, I just want to say I'm so sorry. That sounds highly traumatic on so many levels. Also, if this happened during COVID, that's even like another layer of trauma. So um, uh, you should never stop worrying about your kid. Family first. Uh, and if you work somewhere that doesn't have a family first kind of concept or wanting to work with you as you're trying to balance everything, you need to really think about where you're working. Just going to put it out there right now. Um, I am fortunate. Um, I'm in fronts uh, for the kind of support that I've been getting. And I'm happy to talk offline um, about that because this is a bigger issue. Um, there are there are strategies. Um, first, I would say you may want to work with the trauma. I'm a big fan of something called somatic experiencing. It is learning how to heal trauma, getting in touch with emotions. It's used a lot in talk therapy, but it is frankly better, I think. And it's being uh, provided to a lot of leaders uh, because it helps reset your nervous system faster. Uh, so anyhow, check out somatic experiencing. The other thing I'd say in terms of strategies is um, it is okay to speak up and speak to power. And that is hard, but it is also important to do in a way that you're heard. And I am not saying that you did anything wrong and I'm not even sure of your situation, but there are um, definitely approaches. Um, one is getting others to, if they're seeing this, if it's a systemic issue coming forward in a group um, or maybe it's just a change, change in your approach. So it's more solution oriented or, you know, there's lots of different ways. Again, your situation sounds incredibly hard and I'm so sorry you went through that. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you offline. Um, you can see, well, don't tweet me. I actually got off Twitter, sorry. <laughs> but I'll make sure we find a way to connect. Yes, uh, speaking of which, if you would like to, you can either direct message Megan or also attend the breakout Kessel House room, which uh, she'll be in if you have any other further questions or would like to ask her outside of the scope of this uh, little session right now. Uh, I'm going to pivot slightly because I had a question while um, you were speaking, and that was, um, you know, since so much of open source is done online, are there any kind of unique strategies that you've seen that helps kind of foster that human aspect of building a community? So we can put, you know, PR templates and be very explicit about where they can get help uh, or be very clear about how to contribute for the first time. But are there alternative things like maybe weekly calls where you actually get to see people and talk to them or some other kind of thing like that that helps foster that uh, human aspect when it comes to open source projects? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think, you know, you did bring up documentation and documentation actually really bridges gaps and helps projects be more diverse, both in terms of making it easier to make that first contribution, right? Um, so, you know, just meeting people where they're at and giving explicit instructions of how to be part of this community, um, what's expected of each other. Um, these are really helpful tools. Documentation is incredibly important um, for starting to give people an understanding uh, about a project and how to engage. But in terms of human interactions, um, yeah, I mean, I think the more that you can do to connect at a human level, um, whether it's video and not always about the work, if you can find ways to connect, um, you know, maybe it's around an event um, and the social activities that you bring into them. So even for this kind of a conference, it's online. You can still connect with people and start building those um, relationships. Because at the end of the day, teams really have three kinds of conversations. They have relationship conversations. They have conversations about the opportunities they can create together. And then they have conversations about action. And what research shows is that if you have a limited amount of time, the place to focus most is on relationship building and getting to know each other as humans, not work robots. Um, because once you have this foundation, the opportunities and the action conversations, they just happen. They will just start to flourish. So anything that you can do to connect um, and get to know each other, even if it's like a, a heat check before you dive into the work and getting to know how someone's doing at a human level really goes a long way. I can totally relate to that. And that's a great answer. Um, I joined my company at the start of the pandemic. So there are many co-workers I have not even met yet in person. And wow. so um, a really big part of helping the team connect is to do, um, you know, like a once a month kind of gaming session with each other or just doing something that's not related to work. And I can totally attest that those are super fun and a great way to kind of learn more about your coworker outside of the scope uh, of work. But yeah. I think that can apply to this uh, scenario as well.